All right, doing a bunch of stuff to this Victoria Ivy League, the uh, Harvard clone with the 12-inch. Just stuff to make it better in every possible way without changing what it's intended to be. First off, it had a bunch of rattles, and those rattles were primarily caused by loose baffle. More on that later. And this bracket, which mounts the uh, power transformer to the chassis. It was just a little bit loose, so I tightened it. Next up... While the uh, Victoria branded orange drops were quite good caps, the values are those found in the old fender and they let way too much low end through. It gets really flubby. So I'm going to be changing those for some smaller value caps to tighten up the low end more on that later. In the process of testing all this, I discovered that there was a lot of DC present at the eyelets on the input resistors. And that's common to Harvard's and other amps from this era of fender where the DC just builds up there. So I tried to get it out, and it came back. So later you'll see my solution for that. Here you can see the new caps I chose. They're Synergy Royal Mustards, which look pretty. I'm going to see how they do. So far they sound really good. I don't know if they sound better than something else comparable, but I made a value change. It's not just a material change, so this is just about the values. I also gave up on the leaking DC issue and just replaced the three input resistors mounting them off the board like this. It's pretty, it's structurally sound, and it keeps the DC from creeping in. So no more scratchiness on the guitar volume pot. I also did a few other little things in the uh, circuit just to make the cathodine phase inverter play nicer. You've seen me do that in other amps, original and otherwise. Next up, the mismatched output tubes are gone. A new pair of Tung Sol Reissue 6V6 GTs are in. And crucially, I also put in a new old stock 70s Sylvania 5Y3 instead of the 5V4 that came with the amp. I also changed out that kind of sloppily added in 27K resistor in the bias supply for a nice matching 22K. And you'll see why I changed both the rectifier tube and that resistor in the bias circuit. As the amp came into me, it had a mismatched pair of JJs, uh, which are 14 watt tubes. And with the bias about 63% there, you can see one was 62, the other one was 65. Uh, we had a plate voltage, B plus, of 453.5. And that's 100 volts over what a 6V6 is supposed to take, and uh, about 150 volts over what the screen of a 6V6 is supposed to take. Now, JJ's and electroharmonics can take higher on the plates, like 475. But the screens still don't like anything up in the 450 range. And that's just crazy hot. More importantly... Once the B plus goes up that high, this circuit no longer sounds like an old Harvard. It sounds like a, a new thing. It sounds bigger, but doesn't behave the same as far as the overdrive and compression and, and, and response. So by changing from that 5V4 to the more period correct 5Y3, you can see now with the 13.2 maximum wattage rated tongue saws, bias pretty much exactly at 64%. You can see one's at 63.4, the other one's at 64.8. That brings the plate voltage down to 415. Now that's still well over the data sheet max, but 415, 420, that's what Fender always got away with in the Harvards and the Princetons and the Deluxes. And these tubes will be much, much happier. So the amp's going to be behaving more like an old, say 58, 59 Harvard, as far as the playing dynamics, the response, the nature of the overdrive, how it transitions from clean to overdrive, etc. All the good stuff. Voltage is crucial. Next up, as the amp came in, the volume pot had no response below, just below three on the dial. It just was nothing. So I changed out the volume pot for one that does not cut out below three. And I changed out the tone pot for a linear because the audio taper that was in there bunched all the highs up above three o'clock. And now you have a much wider sweet spot, more able to dial it in with the linear. And the uh, bulb in the lamp was very, very dim and orange, the bulb itself. I changed out for a standard number 47 with a white glow, makes the green really pop out of the jewel. It's pretty. As I mentioned in the first video, someone had removed and then put back the baffle at some point. And when they put it back, they just used standard hex nuts without any additional security. And those hex nuts were just compressing the baffle wood and digging in, and it wasn't tight. So all those have been replaced with a proper Keps nut, as you can see here with the tooth washer, which is not digging into the wood. There's a little washer behind it that spreads out the surface area, and all of them are nice and tight now. Then it was time to remove that poorly installed speaker. Oh, that poor speaker. So the Monster branded cable had to go with those lovely solder joints. I mean, just look at the quality there. 
So good. Mmm. Don't you want some of that tone? Then it was time to make a new speaker cable. So I've got an nice switchcraft plug, 18 gauge cloth covered wire, all twisted and crimped, and then I'm putting a little bit of heat shrink there. Probably not necessary, but it's easy to add. And then putting the sleeve and putting the, the big bit of metal on there and turning it, as you can see. And uh, now it's time to solder that wire to the new speaker. And you can see that the wire is bent over and crimped upon itself mechanically before solder is added. And I'm not using solder as glue, and this wire is pre-tinned, uh, but I'm bringing the iron to the components and then adding the solder to that. You can see that one little loose strand. I want to push that back in place first. The paper towel is a high-tech thing, don't you think? I think the paper towel is going to catch on. It's just to keep solder spatter from hitting the speaker cone. And as the speaker had been installed so poorly, the new one is being installed well. Again, each of them has a uh, number eight washer and a number eight caps nut. The other three screws on the speaker got new ones. This is the remaining original, and uh, I don't know why I chose to photograph this one. Maybe the lighting was just best on that spot. And as for the speaker, we chose a Weber 12A125, which is pretty much a one-to-one -one reproduction of the old Jensen's that would have been in a Harvard. Well, actually, the Harvard would have been a 10. So this is what you might have found in a 5E3 Deluxe back in 1958. I think it's going to take a, about a week to really break in, but it already sounds quite good. And it will sound better next time when you get to hear it.